So it's good to see everyone out. Um, hopefully um, uh, the snow will keep, uh, keep away f um, for a little bit longer. Um, luckily, uh, we didn't have the big snowfall that we had a couple of days ago again. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out. Um, welcome to another chapter event. Uh, my name is Desmond Alvarez. Um, I'm the chapter director. Uh, this is uh, an event that's sponsored by, um, uh, by GARP. Uh, we have um, the kind permission of KPMG to provide, provide us with the room, uh, but we are, GARP is providing a bit of a reception afterwards, so hopefully everyone can stick around and network. Um, in terms of uh, the plan, is really registration, which has happened. Uh, there's a few people still going to trail in. Um, uh, next thing, uh, to, to remind everyone just about the, uh, the GARP convention, which is planned for the end of February, so hopefully... Um, if you have a, an opportunity, you can come out to New York. Um, I'm sure Chris will be, welcome, uh, be happy to welcome you there. <laughs> um, in terms of today, we, get, we have Chris, Chris Donnie who's going to talk about the job task analysis that he did. Um, um, we have uh, a couple of people in, in our group that took part in that. Um, and then we're going to recognize some of the newly qualified FRMs, as well as um, those people who completed their exam. Um, so lastly, it's to uh, get into uh, networking as well as um, allow people to uh, form study groups for those people that are looking to take the exam um, in the next little while, um, in, the May, in the May time frame. Um, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Chris. Um, uh, his um, profile is, um, is up on the uh, GARP website. Um, he's got uh, extensive experience in the financial service space and uh, He's um, earned his MBA from Hamilton College and uh, also operational research from the University of Michigan. Um, I'll hand over to Chris. So welcome, Chris. Uh, so thank you, Desmond, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming out this evening. Um, I'm really happy to, uh, to be able to, to have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, you know, I think it uh, shows my, my commitment to uh, come to Toronto in February. Um, <laughs> not necessarily uh, the, the direction I, I should have been going. I should have headed south, but uh, I'm happy to be here anyway. It's actually very similar to uh, New York right now, a lot of wet slushy snow so uh, uh, so as, as Des mentioned I'm gonna um, do a couple things this evening um, but the first uh, or the, uh, the bulk of the presentation is going to be on this job task analysis we did for uh, the FRM over the last six months um, we really just finished um, the the report um, for this study um, at the end of January and so um, we're still kind of crunching through a lot of the data and as you'll, as you'll see we we did this with a with a third party um, and now we were digging a little more into uh, the specifics and I'll, I'll explain a little bit of that as, as we go through the presentation um, but uh, what I wanted to present tonight are kind of the, the preliminary findings that we we have from doing this study and I think there's um, a lot of interesting stuff there's a lot more that we want to dig into um, and so I'll be curious to hear um, both your reaction to what we have so far, but also if you have ideas on things that you think we should be looking at, uh, I, I'd welcome that input. Um, so uh, much of this kind of repeats what, what Des was talking about. I'm going to take you through the job task analysis in terms of what is a job task analysis, how we went about doing it, who participated in, in the survey that came out of it, and then a summary of the results. Um, as well as some key observations, and then we'll go into the, uh, the recognition for our newly uh, certified FRMs and ERPs. All right, so first of all, job task analysis. Uh, what exactly is a job task analysis? Um, this is a, a quote from uh, the Standards for Educational and uh, Psychological Testing, um, which is one of these organizations that uh, does accreditation of, of certifications. Um, the FRM, or GARP, I should say, has looked into um, getting the FRM uh, accredited and in the process of doing that we learned about these job task analysis so um, this is this is actually something that we've done now um, a couple times um, and if you look back through the, the kind of the history of the FRM um, 
you know, it, it started in 97 and really was, um, you know, kind of a loose organization that put together this exam. We had a lot of good input from a lot of good people, but we didn't necessarily, um, you know, we weren't following kind of a rigorous certification process. And um, as the, the designation has grown and grown, especially as we got to kind of the mid to, uh, to late 2000s and the, and the credit crisis, um, and registrations were exploding. Um, you know, we were growing 40% one year, 70% the next year. Um, you know, the, the value of this certification started to grow and grow. And, and part of that, uh, for our, from our perspective, was the realization that we need to make sure that, you know, we're doing this in, in, the, in the right way. Um, and that was when we went down this path of, a, of accreditation. Um, and one of the things that you learn about a, a, um, certification at, at that level is that you need to do these kind of job task analysis uh, every couple of years to make sure that what you're certifying is what people actually need to do and what they're actually doing on a, on a regular basis um, in the job that, uh, you know, that's being analyzed. And so the purpose for GARP um, is really to look at what do financial risk managers do? What, you know, we're, we're certifying that somebody um, uh, with two to five years of experience has the competent skills to do risk management. So what is it that they need to do? Um, you know, what do they do on a frequent basis? What do they do uh, that's considered important for the function of risk management? Um, and then alongside of that, what are the knowledge, and knowledge areas and skills that uh, an indiv indiv individual needs to have to uh, competently uh, perform those tasks? Um, and so obviously the, the use for GARP um, is the validation of our, our, our FRM program that uh, um, we, we are appropriately certifying that somebody has the right skills to do what a risk manager needs to do. So that, that's kind of the, the overview of what a, uh, a job task analysis is. In terms of um, how it actually gets executed, um, we, we did this with, uh, with Pearson. Um, we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of our exam development now with, uh, with Pearson, and they um, hooked us up with another uh, third party, the International Credential Associates um, uh, to to serve as the the principal investigator for doing this uh, this study um, over the course of an entire weekend um, last summer we had a, a group of um, about thirty uh, FRMs come down and spend the weekend with us um, in which we we went through you know what does somebody with two to five years of experience need to do um, on a daily basis and and used really the, the FRM as a, as a starting point, but we weren't limiting it to kind of the curriculum. We weren't really just trying to say, here's, here's what we test on, make sure this is right. It was more, use this as a starting point, what else is there that we've, we've missed? Um, and so over that, uh, over that weekend and then over the remainder of the summer, we, we designed this survey that would ask people, um, you know, exactly what it is that risk managers do, and what skills do they need to have to, uh, to perform that? Um, in September of last year, we pushed the survey out to, um, to all of uh, our FRMs and to um, other parts of our membership um, to, uh, to take this survey, which was uh, um, a, a non-trivial ask on our part because it, it was a long survey. It took about an hour to, to, to get through. Um, but we were very happy that uh, you know, we did get a good response. A lot of people uh, took the time to go through the survey, which was great. Um, and then over the remainder of the year, we, we uh, you know, worked with, uh, uh, with ICA to you know, collect all the data and start putting it into uh, some kind of a meaningful report, which we finalized, uh, as I said, in January. Um, and so now what we'll do with this is we'll use this to guide um, future curriculum decisions. Um, and so I'm going to kind of take you through some of uh, what, we, what we saw in the in the results. Um, so first of all, um, a little bit about the survey that came out of this. Um, we ended up bucketing um, the tasks and the, the skill sets into 10 domains, um, which you can see listed there, and the number of tasks that uh, we were asking about and the number of, number of uh, knowledge areas uh, or skills that were associated with each one of those domains. Um, you know, probably not any big surprise there in terms of how it how it broke down. Um, again, you know, also not surprisingly, is 
fairly uh, well aligned with uh, with uh, with the FRM, the domains of the FRM, um, with a little more specificity in a couple places, uh, um, which was which was good. And then um, in the survey, what people were asked to do was to um, rate the importance of a given task or an, a given skill um, on a scale of zero to four, of uh, zero being no importance and, and four being very important. Um, ICA does this, these kinds of job task analyses for a lot of certifications, um, and they, as a general rule, will use um, an average uh, importance rating of two and a half, uh, you know, so somewhere between moderately important and important. Um, if, if that comes back as kind of the average uh, score for a particular task or, or knowledge area, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, kind of knock it out of, uh, out of things that would be relevant, but it, it forces the discussion of whether or not it really is something to, that you need to certify in a, in a certification exam. Um, so in terms of uh, the participation, as I said, um, we pushed this out to, to all of our FRMs um, and then to some of our other uh, GARP members. We got um, close to 1,500 participants, which was good. Um, the bulk of them were, were FRMs, uh, which you know, shouldn't be a big surprise. Um, I mean, this is probably most important to the FRMs, and the bulk of the people that we asked were, were FRMs, so um, that, that's, that's not surprising. Um, in terms of what the participants do, um, they, had to, uh, they had to pick which you know, description best described their, their current position. Um, and you can see that a little over half uh, so that they perform risk management tasks. Um, about 20% uh, said that they work with risk managers. 15% um, said that they supervise risk managers. Um, and then about 5% uh, said they teach risk uh, managers. Um, and then the remainder uh, said that they don't currently work in risk management. So there was a percentage as well that, uh, who responded, um, but that they don't currently work in risk management. Um, if you look at uh, the company type, um, you know, this is also very similar to what we see with um, you know, just our own uh, demographics for FRMs and for FRM candidates. Uh, the largest percentage are gonna be from banks, typically big international banks. Um, but we get good participation from asset managers, um, consultants, uh, insurance companies, broker dealers, and, and regulators as well. Um, and that, that actually only adds up to about, uh, I think it's about two-thirds of the, the participants. So there's a whole other third that were a mix of, uh, of many other things as well. And, um, if uh, we look at it by country, um, you know, you, you see uh, probably a pattern that's somewhat similar to what I would say is true for the FRMs in general. Um, the U.S. actually would, would still be at the top. Uh, Canada... Um, is third in, in terms of participation. Um, China and India would actually be higher up if uh, it was just the, the FRMs. Um, you know, we don't necessarily always get as strong a response when we do surveys from, uh, from the Asian countries, but uh, I was glad to see that we got uh, a good number of responses um, you know, from Hong Kong, India, and China. And, China. Um, and then you can see we, we got good participation from, from Europe as well. Um, and then uh, participation by, by highest level of education. Um, and again, this, this is very similar to what we see with the, uh, the FRMs in general, that um, about, uh, about two thirds uh, to three quarters uh, have um, you know, some kind of a graduate degree, either a master's or a PhD. Um, so it, it tends to be a very well-educated uh, uh, population. <coughs> okay, so... Um, now I'm going to go through uh, some of the, the highlights of the results, um, and I'm going to go through the tasks first. And uh, what I've what I've put on here are the tasks that uh, had the highest percentage of very important um, uh, ratings. Right, so you could give a score from zero to four, where four was the very important. Um, I'd just be curious, anybody have any guesses on what, if, you know, this is going to be the top 10 list of things that are, that are on here uh, for tasks of a risk manager. Again, two to five years experience, so it's not the CRO, um, it's really somebody that's kind of relatively junior within the risk organization. Um, 
And any guesses on, on what you'd expect to see in this? VAR, okay. Stress testing. Reverse stress testing. Reverse stress testing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, well, I'm not sure we actually, I, I'd have to go back and look. I'm not sure we, we I'm went sure that. that Yeah. It's actually uh, working from, you know, the stress testing is from worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the flip side, yeah. No, I just mean I, I wasn't sure if we actually had uh, that level of specificity in the, in the, in the tasks. Uh, um, anybody else have any? Yes. Risk assessment? Risk assessment? Okay. All right, so let me, uh, let me pop up the list here. It's actually not, uh, I mean, everything that people have said are, are uh, um, you know, on the list in, in one way or another. Um, so, you know, here's kind of the, uh, the top 10. Um, again, this is the, the task that got the, the highest percentage of, of very important ratings. Um, and I've listed the domain and then the actual, the actual task. So, um, a couple things uh, that, that, you know, that, that I kind of um, picked out in terms of uh, interesting um, observations. I mean, the first is communication. I mean, it's the top of the list, um, and it, it appears twice on the, in the top 10. Um, and we see this anytime we ask about uh, kind of what it takes to succeed in risk management. It always comes back to communication. Um, you know, can you communicate uh, risk, risk models, risk results uh, in a meaningful way to usually outside of uh, uh, the risk organization itself. Um, the second is VAR, uh, which uh, Saprina mentioned. Uh, um, you know, so despite the, uh, um, you know, a lot of the kickback on, on VAR and, and its deficiencies, um, it still is obviously a very important uh, um, model for, uh, for risk managers, um, although you will see that one of the VAR things talks about, uh, you know, knowing how to communicate the deficiencies of VAR, so um, it at least is recognizing kind of some of the, the shortcomings of, uh, of the model. Um, the third is just that there are, um, you know, a lot of kind of core risk management tasks that uh, any risk manager should have to do in terms of being able to assess counterparty risk calculate kind of key um, credit risk measures, um, you know, exactly the, the things that I've highlighted in green there. <laughs> um, the fourth is uh, the role of, of regulation in risk management. Uh, probably not a big surprise there that a lot of people um, in a lot of, a lot of these tasks, uh, anything that had anything to do with regulation popped up as a, uh, a very important uh, task or skill. Um, and then the, the fifth thing that, um, uh, is interesting um, really is that uh, there's nothing from quantitative analysis in the, in the top 10 and um, uh, you know I'll talk more about that as I go along but uh, you'll see um, uh, you know there's been certainly this kind of kickback on uh, skepticism about quantitative models um, uh, and, and it, it doesn't get necessarily the, the highest uh, ratings in a lot of cases and I, I think the um, there are different ways to interpret that, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you some of my thoughts on it if anybody else has uh, other uh, ideas on why some of these things fell to the bottom. Uh, I'd be curious to hear it. Um, so if I look at it by domain, um, you know, in the top 10, you saw risk governance, you saw modeling financial markets uh, and credit risk. Um, so what else uh, didn't we see, or didn't we see in the top 10, but where did they fall in? Um, so for portfolio management, it comes in, you know, relatively soon after the top 10 at 13, um, just kind of a general uh, risk management uh, measurement task. Uh, market risk uh, also coming in at, at 14. Um, you see stress uh, testing uh, comes up uh, pretty quickly. Um, model risk governance, um, you see both uh, documentation and then also uh, regulation appears uh, in, in that particular domain. Um, enterprise risk management, ERM, 
Um, again, you see uh, regulation uh, and all of these obviously, um, you know, if I, if I had listed the actual numbers of uh, percentage of very important, um, it's not a huge spread between, uh, you know, the top 10 and these. Um, where you start to get a, you know, a bit of a bigger spread um, uh, with operational risk, you get this, uh, you know, identifying control weaknesses. Um, I think operational risk in this survey um, did a little poorer than I think is actually true in terms of its importance right now, uh, in part because a lot of it got kind of um, blended between the, the operational risk tasks and the ERM tasks. Um, so I was a little surprised to see that that wasn't closer to the, the, the top. Um, and then the very first thing that we see in quantitative analysis, um, it doesn't pop up until uh, task, the 31st most uh, important task, um, and it immediately is about communicating limitations. Uh, so it's about communication um, and also, uh, you know, limitations of, of models. Um, Uh, so now if I flip it all over and I look at the bottom 10, um, you know, the, the, and if you quickly kind of scan through this, um, you'll notice a couple things. I mean, the first is that seven of the top, or seven of the bottom 10 are in quantitative analysis. Um, as I said, you know, there's, there's uh, kind of been this built up skepticism about uh, quantitative modeling. Um, and I, I don't think that it's necessarily true to say that um, uh, quantitative approaches aren't being done. I think it's more that, um, you know, there, there's parts of the risk group that are responsible for that, and not everybody has to be, um, you know, a, 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 a hardcore quant um, to do risk management. You can actually survive in risk management without uh, having, um, I mean, you certainly have to have quant skills, but you don't necessarily have to have deep, deep uh, uh, quant skills. And then the second thing, um, really, Many of these other tasks, I think, uh, tend to, you know, you'll see like actuarial tables, accounting, uh, economic calendar. I think in some cases these were just kind of probably overspecified in the survey, and, and so they weren't necessarily things that um, people do on a regular basis. So, um, you know, all of these things will be uh, reviewed in the context of the FRM um, to determine if they really need to be covered. Um, or if they need to be de-emphasized de a little or, or even uh, removed from the, from the curriculum. Um, if, I, if I look now at the, the same thing in terms of by domain, um, you know, we saw in the top 10, we saw uh, those three domains, um, quantitative analysis, risk governance, and modeling, but what about the other ones? Um, and if I, if I scroll through these, what you'll tend to see is that um, uh, they're, they're kind of specific things that, um, you know, again, probably aren't done that frequently. So financial markets, put call parity, important conceptually, not something that people are probably going to be using on a daily basis. Uh, um, market risk and, and the use of exotic options, again, it's probably not, uh, not so frequent that people are, are doing these kinds of things. Um, and so it, it got a lower, um, uh, a lower overall um, importance rating. Um, operational risk, extracting correlation structures. Correlation is hard enough to measure kind of in market risk. You move to, to operational risk and uh, this certainly isn't going to be something that gets done on a regular basis. Um, and this is true of kind of all these, these bottom things for each one of the domains. Um, all right, so now on the, uh, the knowledge and skills, and what you'll see with the, the knowledge and skills, obviously um, we've talked about what was most important in terms of uh, the tasks, so uh, you should see um, a good overlap with uh, the, top, uh, the top skills. Um, and again, this is gonna be the highest percentage of very important ratings. Um, and so, with this, if you, if you look, uh, you know, a couple things that stand out. I mean, obviously the top one, you know, anybody who is doing risk management, they need to, to know what is market risk, what is credit risk. So um, knowing basic risk types is going to pop up to the top. That seems pretty logical. Um, again, VAR uh, and the importance of VAR, knowledge of VAR, uh, being able to uh, uh, make sense of VAR um, is going to be an important skill set for a, uh, for a risk manager. Liquidity risk, um, this is one that uh, uh, almost certainly has risen 
dramatically in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm sure if we looked at the results from the last job task analysis, um, liquidity risk would not be as high up on this list. Um, stress testing uh, pops up a couple times in the top 10. Um, interest rates, obviously, uh, interest rates and knowing uh, measures of interest rate uh, sensitivity um, is going to be a very important skill for a risk manager. Um, knowledge of, uh, of risk management strategies and being able to explain what, what risk managers do um, is, a, is an important skill. And then clearly just having knowledge uh, of uh, financial products. Um, you know, all of these things are um, you know, pretty logical. And, and, and what you'd expect, and, and you know, from the perspective of, uh, from my perspective, um, you know, it, it's very consistent with all the things that we're testing in the FRM. And so, um, you know, in, in large measure, it, it validates the, the curriculum that we already have um, and, and assures us that really the tweaks that we need to make are kind of on the smaller end. We are testing really the right stuff within the, uh, the certification. Um, if, I, if I then look also again by domain, um, the first five uh, show up. Uh, in the top 10, um, but then if I look at the other five, model risk governance, um, you know, being, having knowledge of uh, model weaknesses and, and limitations, um, you know, we've talked about that a couple times, is very important. Credit risk, um, uh, counterparty risk is, uh, is the, the, the top uh, skill um, in that domain. Portfolio management, uh, concentration risk um, and, and exposure. Um, it's the top one there. Um, uh, the top one in terms of quantitative uh, analysis is simulation, uh, you know, so having uh, skills and, and abilities in the, in the uh, domain of, of simulation is the, the first thing that we see um, in quantitative analysis. Um, and then uh, in operational risk, it's just really general knowledge of, of operational event types. Um, this is probably getting at kind of uh, the regulatory uh, domain or uh, event types and the, and the underlying factors. Um, so that's, that's kind of a summary of uh, the highlights in terms of the, the tasks and the, the knowledges and, and the skills. Um, another couple other things that uh, I just wanted to show you um, uh, to kind of calibrate, you know, where everything was. This shows you the average important ranking um, across all the tasks within a particular domain. And so, um, you know, a couple things uh, stand out here. Um, you know, the top three model risk governance, uh, financial markets and, and ERM, uh, got the highest uh, average importance ranking, um, which, you know, I think is, is not a, a big surprise. Um, quantitative analysis, again, that, that kind of fell um, you know, pretty markedly below uh, a lot of the other uh, domains. Um, and then kind of in the middle, you have kind of the core risk management categories that you'd expect to have kind of a, um, a uniform uh, distribution of, of uh, importance rankings. Um, same thing with, uh, with the knowledge um, and skill areas. Um, you know, the top three, again, are model risk governance, uh, ERM, uh, and financial markets, and again, uh, quantitative analysis uh, fell down um, to the to the lowest. Um, so, next, I just wanted uh, to show um, one of the results that we started looking at, which is um, looking at not only by domain but by function. So, this is looking at how people that um, you know were in each one of those those uh, risk uh, functions. Um, you know, what their average important ranking was by domain. And um, so the, the first one, the blue one, is people that are no longer, not presently involved in risk management. The red um, is people that are performing um, risk management tasks. That's their primary function. Uh, the green is um, working with risk managers. The, uh, the purple is supervising uh, risk managers. And then uh, the, the light blue is teaching risk management. Um, and so let me, I'll show it this way, but n what I did next was subtracted out the, uh, the average so you can kind of see more quickly uh, where, um, where the differences are. Um, and so now you can kind of see by the things that pop up and down, um, you know, who, 
who was, where the emphasis is, right? So um, the first thing, if you look at those purple bars, that's the, the supervisor. So what, what did they think was, uh, you know, the most important? And you see um, a lot of emphasis on risk governance, model risk governance, um, and ERM. Um, if you then look at the light blue bar, uh, which is the people that are teaching risk management, um, you see much more emphasis on quantitative analysis um, and on market risk, which, you know, those, are, those are, tend to be topics that, that do get taught um, and emphasized in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of risk management programs is, you know, kind of, again, like more um, hard, hardcore quant skills, which, um, again, I, I, I am a, a, a firm believer in, in, in quant stuff, so I'm, I'm not... Uh, um, I'm not one to bash it at all, but I, I do think that the, um, the trend has been we don't need as much sophisticated math as we need just kind of the intuitive understanding of, of, of markets um, and of processes. And that's what you see with kind of the emphasis on governance and on ERM. Um, and I think that, that is a, a trend that, uh, that we've uh, seen over the last couple of years. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, I guess it's not really surprising, it's almost amusing, the, the blue bars, you know, they're almost all down, meaning that the people that don't do risk management um, had a much lower kind of importance ranking for risk management tasks overall. Um, you know, again, it's probably not that surprising, um, but it, uh, you know, maybe is uh, part of a, a perception value for risk, the value of risk management. Um, do the same thing, or we did the same thing with looking at the, the knowledge and skills, uh, both by domain and by function. And again, I subtracted out the average so you kind of see where the, uh, quickly see where the differences are. Um, and again, um, you see the same kinds of trends. The supervisors place uh, much greater importance um, uh, on most knowledge areas than, than other groups, uh, but particularly in um, risk governance, model risk governance, uh, and operational risk. Um, and the, 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 the people who teach risk management, there's more emphasis on, um, on quantitative analysis and on, uh, on uh, modeling. Um, and then again, the, the people that are not kind of active in risk management kind of gave all of the skills a, a much lower average, um, uh, average importance ranking. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's... Um, there's still a lot more that we want to do with this data. And, and in the same way that I looked at it, both by, um, by domain and by function, we want to do the same thing by country and by uh, the, the type of organization to see, you know, how do the asset managers compare to the insurers, to the banks, um, and where are those differences and see if there are particular trends that, that can be pulled out of it. Um, and then also look at, um, you know, we asked questions about how much experience people have, you know, are, are they... Uh, um, you know, they worked in risk management, you know, zero to two years, you know, all the way up to, uh, uh, you know, 25 or more years and, uh, you know, look to see where those, see where those opinions differ. Like what, what, is, what does somebody who's new to risk management think about it relative to somebody who um, has been doing it for a long time? Um, the, the, the last part of the, the survey actually just had this open-ended question about what changes do you expect to to see in, in financial risk management over the next couple of years. Um, and so these were just, uh, you know, people could just write in whatever response they wanted. And um, out, of the, out of the 1,400 responses, I think um, we got about 600, you know, text answers um, that I haven't categorized or, you know, rigorously kind of gone through and counted. Um, I went through it and then kind of based on my own uh, what caught my eye as popping up a lot, uh, you know, jotted down some notes. And so um, the things that, uh, that appeared a lot, um, one probably is not surprising, uh, more regulation. It was interesting to see um, there were differing opinions about um, what people are expecting to see in regulation. So, um, you know, certainly probably people that uh, are kind of in the throes of uh, of Basel III implementation and, and uh, um, you know, the whole new kind of liquidity uh, requirements. Um, they talked more about complexity. Um, 
I think there, there's a lot of uh, developments going on with uh, um, yeah, at least talk amongst the regulators to simplify uh, regulations and move to something simpler um, and a more emphasis on standardized approaches, leverage ratios. Um, so there was even talk on the flip side that they're going to expect to see it all get simplified. Um, you know, I, definitely uh, there were more complexity than there were simplicity. It was just interesting that there was this kind of uh, split between the, the opinions that you saw um, uh, in, the, in the responses. Uh, compliance uh, was another big topic, obviously, that kind of goes along with the first one. Um, compliance is a, is a topic that uh, I'm sure a lot of you um, in, the, in risk functions, um, you know, compliance get, seems to get folded more and more into the, um, into the risk function, and so there were a lot of comments about, uh, about compliance. Um, Still a lot of uh, discussion about less VAR, more stress testing. Um, you know, that came up in a, in a, lot, of, a lot of places. And along those lines, um, a lot of opinions about, uh, you know, quantitative versus qualitative, um, probably, you know, less quantitative, more qualitative kinds of uh, uh, analyses. Um, more, more and more on, uh, on liquidity risk. That continues to be a, a hot topic and was uh, certainly one of the things that uh, popped up a lot in the discussion of things that um, you know, people are expecting to see more focus on liquidity risk. Um, and then the last one um, was greater emphasis on uh, data quality, information security, cybersecurity, um, which again, that's a, that's a very big topic that uh, you know, we we at GARP hear a lot about, uh, about cybersecurity, cyber risk, um, and so it wasn't surprising to see a lot of people talking about, uh, about that as a uh, more emphasis on that particular area. Um, so just to uh, kind of wrap things up, um, as I said, I mean, the, the whole purpose of this job task analysis um, was really meant to be um, both a, a validation of the FRM curriculum and also um, kind of a guide, uh, a guide post in terms of what changes we might need to, to make um, to the curriculum. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to go through uh, uh, analyzing um, the data that we're seeing and seeing where we might need to make tweaks to, uh, to, to the curriculum. Overall, you know, I, I don't think we found um, things that were drastically off from where we are currently. Um, but you know, we have uh, the FRM committee meets uh, a couple times a year, and we have a, a meeting coming up uh, alongside the convention. Um, and, you know, we'll spend a, a good half a day going through um, these results and seeing if there are particular things that we want to adjust. Um, and then, you know, the, the results, the, you know, I, I went through this in the presentation, so I won't, uh, I won't kind of bore you with it again. Um, and, and also with the, um, the considerations for the future. Um, so before I, uh, before I move on to, uh, to anything else, let me just kind of stop here and see if anybody uh, has any questions or reactions to anything that, uh, that you've seen here. So one of the things to add is that Chris has got um, responsibility for developing the FRM and uh, ER, ERP. So if, um, y if you have any questions about that, that's good. So I'm not yet an FRM, but I consider that capital allocation is very important at the bank, and I haven't seen the, that in the survey. Yeah, we, we um, my guess is it, it, I mean, it was covered in, in the tasks. It just didn't pop up in terms of, um, it, it actually gets covered in our, our integrated risk management section of the FRM, uh, so in the, the part two curriculum. Um, but I, I, I couldn't, I, I don't know off the top of my head kind of where it ranked, but I, it certainly is in there. Hi. Um, so thanks for doing this uh, job task analysis. As a student who wants to go into the risk management, uh, it's good to know that um, the things that I'm learning from the FRM program is something that I'll be use, using in the job market. Um, but I had, a, some, I had some question about the survey design. Like, so when you're um, doing the survey, What's the list of the tasks um, that you're asking based on the FRM current curriculum, or did you add like another, like new topics that are not 
being tested. Right yeah, now. so um, uh, we started, so we, we got a, a group of about 30 FRMs together for a weekend, and this is where we, we did start with the FRM curriculum just to kind of get people going, but we, we made it clear from the outset that we didn't want it to be restricted to that, and so if there are other things that people, um, and most of the people that were involved probably were, um, you know, beyond five years of work experience. So um, the question was, is this something you would ask somebody with, say, two to, two to five years of work experience? What else would you um, expect that, that individual to do on a, on a regular basis, and what skills would you expect them to have? So um, it wasn't restricted to the, I mean, over the course of the weekend, it drifted and in, in, uh, it spilled off into new directions. So um, no, we, we, we didn't want it to be um, just kind of validate here are the things that we test on the FRM and let's just pat ourselves on the back. Um, and we, if anything, I would say we, we tried to push it as far away from the FRM as possible. So, um, Hi. So I noticed when you were doing the breakdown by, uh, uh, of knowledge and skills um, that supervisors placed a lot of emphasis on operational risk and governance and then where the educators were placing a lot of risk on the uh, quantitative stuff. So. Uh, are there any initiatives to kind of close that gap or kind of bridge that gap? Because, you know, it's uh, you know it's kind of the educators are focusing on the quantitative, and then we saw from the survey results that the quantitative, in terms of job tasks, is uh, you know not quite as high up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's kind of not ill preparing them, but it's kind of you know uh, not giving them the complete picture of what's. Uh, of what, what's yeah, important? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, so I'd say a couple things on that. I mean, one, um, and I, I guess I should uh, admit I, I had lunch with uh, some academics today, so we were talking about this exact topic, um, and the reality is that anybody coming into risk management, they are going to have to have quantitative skills. I mean, whether or not it's, uh, you know, a PhD in math, um, and they're, they're doing really higher level math, um, or just something like simulation, you're going to have to have some basic uh, quantitative skills. Um, I think part of the message that you should get from this is that if you really want to succeed in, in risk management, you really want to advance in risk management, communication is going to become much, much important. And so being able to um, not just run the numbers, but able to explain to somebody what those, those numbers mean um, and, and put it in a context that um, somebody who doesn't have the quantitative skills uh, can attach some meaning to um, is, is critical. Um, things like risk governance and, uh, um, uh, and, and operational risk, um, you know, you, you actually, it is, it's a much harder thing to, to, to find programs that teach uh, a lot of those things. Um, and I think that's where, um, you know, especially the, the, the programs that are, you know, um, in business schools that put more emphasis on, on management, um, like that, that's probably the direction that it needs to go, is that there, there's more emphasis on, on management and less, ma less uh, emphasis on um, super hardcore, like, quant uh, kinds of programs. Um, you know, but I, I expect... Uh, you know, I expect you'll see those kinds of changes with, with some of the programs. I think some of the programs, um, you know, some of the programs have kind of evolved from financial engineering programs, from quantitative uh, finance programs, and so they, they already have that bias, and that's kind of what people expect from them. Um, so I'm sure those programs will continue to kind of move in those directions, but I think, um, you know, I, I, I think you will see more and more programs that, that get designed more. Um, with the understanding that we, w we want people to be kind of confident with their quantitative skills, but they don't have to be kind of uh, overboard with those skills, um, but they have a much uh, better sense of, of governance and management and also communication. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent, um, maybe something like the ERP, you know, the energy risk professional, might be a template for, say, some of the more esoteric or quantitative, hardcore quantitative aspects under the current FRM. 
I don't know to what extent, maybe there's some confirmation bias built into the results from the survey um, to the extent that a lot of people don't deal with the, the really esoteric stuff, and so it may not seem as important. Um, it, so like uh, there in some of the slides, it seemed to suggest that there was less importance attached to some of the more, uh, you know, hardcore quantitative um, or very specific quantitative applications yeah. in risk management. And you sort of wonder, I mean, one question I would ask would be to what extent did that almost deserve its own focus, oh, if you like? Oh, I see. Because to yeah, the extent that uh, people don't deal with it, they may it not be. It's, think it's, it's important. It's an interesting um, observation, and I, I was trying to say that in the sense, um, and I think what you just alluded to was that you know, if again, if you look at a risk management function, you know, some of those more esoteric quant skills are needed, but we only need these two or three guys to to do that, and not the whole team to do that. And so, um, when I ask the whole group like, what's important? That gets that gets a lower rating, um, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, I think there is some of that going on in in these results. Um, but uh, the the point you were making about kind of like maybe uh, maybe there sh needs to be a follow on, and that um, that's something that we've looked at for the FRM is that, you know, maybe the FRM is kind of the core, and then we need to have these uh, these kind of continuing ed modules that are focused on, you know. Deeper, uh, deeper dives into quantitative analysis, deeper dives into credit risk. Um, and so that, that is kind of an area that some of the continuing ed might, might evolve. Uh, I mean, the, the continuing ed for the FRM is still a new thing and we're, we're kind of trying out different, different uh, bits and pieces and seeing what kind of response we get. But we, we've talked about doing that kind of a follow-on approach uh, for some of these things that maybe Maybe not everybody does need to know some of these more specific things, but maybe there are a fair number of people who would be interested, and, and, uh, and it, it makes sense for a risk function to have people that know those particular areas, so, um, yeah. Um, can you speak to whether or not the educators were those in the, like, financial engineering programs or quantitative finance programs or not? Uh, I, I mean, I can't speak to it in the sense that I, I haven't been able to, I don't, it, it was an anonymous survey, so I don't know, um, you know, who the individuals were. And they might not be, um, it, it could be risk management trainers, it could be, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, uh, like a, a, a professor at a university, it, it could be, um, you know, somebody who works for uh, training at, at S&P or, you know, I don't know, uh, so, but I don't, I don't know exactly. Uh, Hi, Chris. So my question would be, first of all, if you look at the number of people that participated, about 1,400, right? What is the that percentage of the population of FRM holders who, who actually do uh, practicing risk management? Second, don't you think that the percentage that participated may have affected whether those people that participated were actually quant people who really want to emphasize on quant skills relative to those who didn't participate? Thank you. Um, uh, so the first part of the question was, um, what percentage of the actual F, like so of the 32,000 FRMs, what percentage of them are actually doing risk management? Uh, okay. I will rephrase the question. <laughs> we have, let's say, 1,500 participating in, the, in yeah. the, the survey, right? Right. So what percentage of that is the total FRM population? What percentage uh, of the population? Population, what percentage of How the... How many is the population? Oh, uh, of the population of FRMs is 32,000. Okay, so when you look at the 1,400, finally it's very, very, a little bit insignificant, it's less than 50, it's, it's a very small percentage. So second, given that the 1,400 may, they may, the result may be biased. They are not really want skilled guys, and maybe the remaining part, part, percentage <laughs> that didn't really participate might be the core quantitative guys that you cannot really get the opinion because they didn't participate. They're, they're not good at doing surveys because they do all the uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, 
I will say um, we actually got a much higher percentage. Uh, you know, so like I said, this this organization ICA that that did the the bulk of the study for us. They do these certifications for a lot of, um, or they do these studies for a lot of certifications, um, and they were very pleased with the overall um, response rate that we got for the survey. So, um, you know, getting about 1,400 was not considered like a bad thing. I mean, we were asking people to take an hour um, to to answer. What's that? Yeah, it was it was a very long survey, and so. Um, like, like I said, I mean, it was kind of a big ask on our part for people, and um, I, don't, I don't know if I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to try to speak for the whole room, um, but if I get something that's asking me to take a survey that's more than a couple questions, um, you know, I, it, it better be something that I really care about and if, uh, if, um, if I'm going to spend an hour uh, responding to it. Um, so to get, to get that high of a, a response rate was actually considered a positive um, for the study. But it, um, looked, it looked also from the results that you got a good mix of people. It wasn't just one group that was. Yeah, good. and I, I um, I'd have to, I'll have to go back and look to see what demographics we have on like job function to see if there was a like, um, you know, not a lot of people that would call themselves a quantitative analysis uh, analyst um, versus a supervisor. I'd, I'd have to go back and look, uh, but yeah, go ahead. Oh. Chris, thank you very much for coming. Sure. When I look at the list, communication skill is very important. When I look back at my experience, I found that sometimes you just have plain bad luck that things happen. But in many other <laughs> cases, my guess is what was behind it really was psychology and cognitive dissonances in plain English that you made some thinking problems worse than they should have been. Any plans of addressing that in the training going forward? Any ideas how to guard um, against that? I, I, well, I'd have to think about that, but uh, uh, maybe that's another area that we need to kind of consider follow on. I mean, actually, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things that um, I, is almost amusing to this whole thing is that, yeah, th the first thing on the list is communication skills. The FRM is a multiple choice exam, right? There's no, that, there, that's the opposite of communication skill, right? Uh, um, so it kind of demands follow on, you know, uh, follow on education um, in some other areas and maybe, um, you know, certainly communication skill. And that's something that we've, we've also looked at adding to the, the continuing ed is looking for um, things that we can provide to FRMs that are more on the soft skills of, of communication and, and interacting within a, an organization. Um, but maybe, maybe something along the lines of what you're talking about would, would also be another area to look at. Um, uh, what's that, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I guess, a recommendation going forward. Uh, to encourage more people to participate in the survey uh, is making it mandatory. I know there's credits that people must attain to actually uh, continue with that. From, yeah, just make it part of. Uh, I think it, we did offer CPD, although it's not CPD isn't mandatory for. Um, Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, we, sh we, we can t we'll continue to find ways to get better participation. Um, I think although the numbers were low, they are like the, in terms of a survey response, it was quite yeah, high. Yeah. So, and, that, and that's what the feedback you got from the right, right, research right. company. Right. Um, so I, I basically have two questions. So in relation to compliance, there's been some talks amongst the industry and um, basically where I came from, the UK, and then moving here. So I've been hearing about the three lines of defense. Mm -hmm. So one of which is, um, you know, risk management would form part of it. So in, in the survey or your experience, where do you see risk management playing that model? 
And then the second question I have is, I'm actually working in operations. So one of the challenges I face with senior management is actually how do I sell risk management? How do I make it a priority for them? Because currently, their very top priority is profit. However, I would, how do I balance it with risk management? Um, all right, so the, uh, the, uh, the first question was more about um, uh, how, really how do I build a strong risk culture? Um, and I, I mean, I think the answer in, in both cases, or maybe, and I, maybe it's not an answer, I mean, it, it's kind of what you're asking, which is how do I, how do I get buy-in from the, the board? Because um, all of these things depend upon a strong risk culture, and all of, all of that depends upon having uh, buy-in from the top. I mean, that is the, the key to building a strong risk culture, is making sure that the people at the top believe in that, and then they're going to make sure that it, it gets pushed throughout the entire organization. Um, uh, I don't know if I have the, the, a good answer for you know how to sell it, how to sell like the um, the value uh, of risk management to your board members. Um, you know, I think I think recently that's been an easier sell, right? Because there's been so much emphasis on building stronger risk cultures and avoiding. Uh, you know the, the the perils of the the crisis and and now all of the things going on with regulation that uh, it's not as hard of an argument. Um. Um, just, did you have the second one? Uh, yeah, just uh, just say just something to share the the things that I've I, you know I've learned with other with other banks. Um, so whenever there is a crisis, regulation is actually getting stricter. Hmm. However, when things when the profits are growing. It tends the you know the compliance is actually much more more or less. It's a it's, it's a cycle. Yeah, no, that, and, uh, of course it is, and you know, but the only thing I'd say right, right now, I mean, especially the way they've set up Basel three and the whole like the the length of the implementation, um, it 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 hasn't been able to go away, right? You you couldn't uh, you can't avoid. Um, kind of the long cycle that they've kind of pushed into it. The, the biggest problem that I, maybe not the biggest problems, but one of the problems you'll, you'll probably a lot of you already see with, with that is then because the bank is spending so much money on implementation of Basel III, pushing other initiatives that, that uh, um, would be valuable from a risk management perspective are harder, you know, it, it becomes more, well, do we have to do this? Um, is this part of the regulation when you say no? Well, let's worry about that later. Um, you know, and I, I agree. I mean, that, that there's a real cycle to kind of uh, risk aversion. I guess there's also an element of the regulator then stepping in and fining people and then forcing people to change their practices. Mm -hmm. so, um, any other questions that we have? Um, sorry, I have one more question. Uh, does the GARP does any work with the regulator in terms of like forcing the risk management into the like, company like mandate? Because I hear like it's hard for individuals to sell the risk res management to the senior ma senior manager, but it'd be easier if like uh, this kind of organization work together in, with the regulator to make that happen. I guess. Yeah, I mean, we we actually do a fair amount with um, uh, with. With uh, with the regulators um, as well as with um, the senior risk managers. So, um, for several years now, we've been doing these um, these forums where um, GARP will will partner with. Um, we've partnered with the New York Fed twice, with the Bank of England twice, um, with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority uh, a couple times, um, and we do these uh, two-day invited um, forums where we get. Um, CROs, uh, top, uh, top academics, and then the regulators, and we discuss issues. Um, and um, I think it's actually helped a lot in terms of keeping kind of communication open and getting the feedback both from, uh, you know, from the regulators to the banks, but the banks also to the regulators, um, and, and, you know, really building uh, better lines of communication. So I think that's been a valuable thing that, uh, that we've done and that, uh, you know, we, we've we will continue to do, and the thing that's been good um, for us and for the risk 
profession, I think, is that we, we have a very good relationship now with these regulators, and so, um, you know, we, we have a kind of open line of communication with them as well, so. Any last questions? Um, so thank you, uh, Chris, for that uh, great insight. Okay. And mm. Um, okay, so thank you, and uh, now what I wanted to do, uh, we wanted to recognize the individuals uh, in the Toronto area that have become uh, certified um, FRMs and ERPs over the last, uh, I think it's really the, la the last half of, of 2014. Um, so let me start with uh, the newly certified FRMs. Um, so this is the list that I have from, uh, from our uh, administration. Um, of people that were uh, certified through like last week, um, you know, in, in uh, the last half of uh, 2014. Um, if you see your name on this list, uh, could you come up to the front of the room so we can... Uh, so I have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the, the names that are highlighted in green um, were the, the people that that re no, no, uh, that registered they registered before the deadline and so they they highlighted uh, those were the names that they, they were hopeful that those individuals would show up obviously more people showed up than um, than actually got into the registration before whatever the deadline was um, but uh, you know, I, I, I uh, obviously, um, I'm a big believer in the, in the FRM, um, but one of the things that I, I always tell people is that it, it's not an easy process. I mean, the, the program, um, th there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of content, and the exam um, is, is designed in a pretty rigorous uh, fashion to, to, to be uh, non-trivial. Um, this isn't kind of your, your basic compliance test of just checking boxes. Um, it, it, takes a, it takes a commitment to, to get through it. So. Um, I congratulate all of you and, and get into it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the other, the other group of uh, people for the FRM that I wanted to recognize are the people that, uh, that passed the Part 2 exam in November. So essentially they have completed um, all of the, all the testing requirements um, for the FRM. And the only thing that's left is validating um, or demonstrating two years of work experience. Um, so they're, they're um, you know, when we report the results for November in, uh, in early January, um, we get flooded with everybody's resumes and it takes a couple months to get through it. So some of these people probably um, have all the, the requirements to, to be certified, they just haven't gotten through the queue. Um, and I, I did this same kind of meeting a couple weeks ago in London um, and I'll tell you the same thing I told them. If you see your name on this list and you actually have two years of work experience and you've submitted all your paperwork, um, come and talk to me afterward, and I can actually tell the people back at the office to find your um, thing and get it through the, the, the process uh, in the next couple of days, so that you um, you know you, you get you get uh, moved up. But uh, was anyone named up there? That want to come yeah, yes, please come forward. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, let's get another picture here.
Great, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, it is? Okay. So there's a number of you that are um, looking to... Um, Where am I going? To, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so the, the last group uh, that I wanted to recognize, so in addition to the FRM, we've got the, the energy risk professional, um, which, uh, you know, is a, is a much younger program, but it continues to grow. Um, and uh, there, there are a few people in the, the Toronto area that uh, either have become certified or passed the, um, the November exam. Um, you know, I, I, like I was saying about the FRM, uh, the ERP is equally challenging, if not more so, because um, the resources uh, that, that, that you have in going through the FRM program um, really are not there for the energy program at this point. I mean, they, we have uh, study materials and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have um, you don't have the same you know level of uh, other exam prep providers. Um, so the commitment that uh, these individuals have made is a is a significant one. Um, are, did anybody uh, anybody on this list uh, that made it this evening? Please please come on up. All right. Okay, so um, the, the very last uh, uh, piece of business um, for anyone who has actually signed up to take the, um, the May exams, either uh, for the FRM or the ERP, um, in a minute we will uh, kind of break for the, the reception. If you are um, signed up for the May exams and you're interested in, in being a part of a study group, at least exploring it, um, just come up to the front of the room and then we'll, we'll break you up into groups from there, right? Yeah, I was going to say, those people who are looking to take the exam, keep an eye on the people that just passed and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and get a chance to, um, to talk to them. That's what I was trying uh, uh, to okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Yeah, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. So thank you, everyone. I, I appreciate your... Uh,